Welcome back folks. So we're going to do a little bit different approach to the teachings. So I'm going to go into a why and a explanation for the live execution you guys watched on Friday, treating the ES. Before I get into it, if you have not watched the live execution video, the full form video, do that first. It's silent. It doesn't have anything. No audio. So there's no necessity for a subtitle <laughs> for the folks that are asking in the comment section. I want you to watch the video. It's about 30 minutes in length. Now I already know some of you are already complaining saying there ain't no way I'm going to sit there and watch a 30 minute video by ICT. I'll speed it up two times the speed and watch it in 15 minutes. And you will be cheating yourself of the opportunity of training yourself, seeing what it's like to be in the real market condition. Many times when I show an example of me executing live trades, the sped up approach that I use to condense everything into a two minute and 20 second vignette on Twitter, sometimes it will condition the students to anticipate that their trade should run away real quickly towards their profit. And that's not my intent. My intent is for you to be inspired by the executions and the examples using the logic and the concepts that I've codified over the years. But the importance is for you to go into your charts and watch that pan out in your own observations. Now, some of you may not have the ability to watch real time price action and you're relegated to simply using a Forex tester if you're trading Forex or market replay, you know, something to that effect. And I'm not trying to discourage anyone from doing that, but there's nothing better than watching real time price delivery. And the investment of buying some kind of a screen recording application or downloading one that may be free like OBS. Um, I have no affiliation with any company, so I get asked a lot, what do I use to make these videos and record my screens and such? I use Camtasia by TechSmith.com. I've been using them since the first video I made on Baby Pips, and I fell in love with the simplicity of it all. Uh, it works well. Um, you don't have to have that one. You know, any kind of screen recording application, if you're at work, school, sleeping, running a business, you can't be in front of price action, recording it, having a way to see the price action on multiple time frames, like have an hourly chart, a 15 minute chart and a five minute chart or a 15 minute chart, a five minute chart and a one minute chart and record how the price behaves. And then when you get home or wake up, then you can play that back and you can get so much more insight by having studied that you can pause it, see it, like it really is delivering real time. Market replay on TradingView is a little bit stilted. It's wooden feeling. It's it's not organic. Whereas if you watch real time price delivery, you're seeing every fluctuation up and down, up and down until the candle closes and a new one opens. And you want to be able to submit yourself to watching how long it takes for price to do that very thing and not run for your stop and run to your first objective, second objective, and ultimately to terminus, which would close your trade. But you want to be doing these things before, long before you put a live trade on and long before you press a demo. Now, some of you don't like to hear those things and I understand because you're in a hurry. You want to get out there and start making money right now because you got bills to pay and ends to meet and places to go and people to see. I get it. I get it. But you can't rush excellence. And that's what you should be striving for. Not, I just got to get in here and start doing what everybody else is doing. When 90% are losing money. So, it's no surprise when people rush into this, they end up part of that herd. So, when I show you this example here today, I want you to think about how all of this was being done calculated 
determined all real time. Okay, I had the hard right edge to the right of my chart. I had no advantage of knowing beforehand because of market replay. And the aftermath of being right or wrong, I had to contend with that. And I was counseling my son by watching both the ES and the NASDAQ. I'm presently teaching him how to navigate certain things in price action that has been problematic for him and his understanding. So when I look at price action, I'm looking at things that are going to be obvious, an obvious run on liquidity and not an obvious run to inefficiency. And in case you're wondering, the screen is sitting here waiting for me to press play on a recording I've already made. I'm going to play a video that's already uploaded on my YouTube channel. And it's the 30 minute duration of the execution I did on Friday's ES trading. It was just the morning session. It wasn't me trying to do the entire range, but I'm going to go through the process of explaining things like understanding when you're offside. Offside means you're on a trade or in a trade and you discover that you're on the wrong side of the marketplace. In other words, you, you went long when you really shouldn't be long and probably better for you to either be out of the market or going short or vice versa. So I'm going to go through the process that I used to determine that I was offside on my initial position. And then I flipped the script and then got in sync and beat the socks off of it. All right. So we're watching the S&P on the left hand side. I just went short five contracts. And what I'm doing here is I was looking for this shaded area down here. Okay, so the shaded area at the bottom here, I already don't like what this is doing. <laughs> I want this border thing to go away down here where it shows the player's timeline. But uh, below this low, there's sell side and inefficiency down here. Okay, and I talked about that uh, on Friday. But we also had this buy side and balance, sell side and efficiency between this candle's low and this candle's high. We had relative equal lows. We've already swept that and we ran above. And initially I thought that we came up in here, took these buy stops and rebalanced to this inefficiency. We spent time there and then left. Came down into this area here and look real close. You'll see that there is a volume imbalance there. So I felt that we had already worked off any need to go higher initially. And I wanted to see it run for sell side, take this sell side, hit this, and then maybe go into TGIF, which is 20 to 30% of the weekly range retracement. But what I was looking at is right here inside this shaded area, which is the buy side of balance, sell side of efficiency, which is a fair value gap. I was willing to take the trade knowing that if I did get stopped out, it's not that much of a, a risk. It's, it's rather small. And it's easy for me to recoup this. This is for your notes, folks. Okay, If you're watching my videos and you don't take notes, you're literally wasting your time. Go watch something else on Netflix because you'll probably be better off doing that than simply trying to watch something here by me, which is highly technical. A lot of rules and procedures and protocols that are being introduced to you. And you're not going to retain it by just simply listening. You have to write it down. You have to put it in your journal. You have to go into the market looking for these things to repeat, not to simply say, well, ICT said it, so therefore it must be true. Don't do that. I want you to go in and test and see. Study. Measure it. See if there's any validity to it. Or I'm just a magician and I can perform these things on, of myself and no one else can do it either. When you all can see now that I have profitable students all around the world doing it. But I want to see, can we get past this inefficiency that's this shaded area here, which is defined by this candle's low and this candle's high, but the formidable factor that needs to be overcome is the down close candle right there. So I watched it. It goes into it here. And I'm waiting for this to completely overlap it and go through it and then dig down into this candle 
and I want to see it accelerate towards the consequent correction of this. If it would have done a run to this midpoint of this wick here, I would have added more shorts there with the anticipation that we would go to this low and down to this shaded area here in the blue. But watch how price behaves at this down close candle because that's a bullish order block. If I'm bearish and I teach my students, if they're if you're bearish, you want to see down close candles be smashed through. You don't want to see any respect of that at all. That's bearish institutional order flow. You don't need some kind of depth of market. You don't need some you don't need some kind of a VWAP or volume profile stuff. You don't need that. Okay. I'm not trying to discourage the folks that use it and are making money with it. I'm just saying that that thing that you're applying your faith to has nothing to do with what price is doing. So watch how price behaves as we trade into this. Now, again, I'm I'm playing this back at two times the speed because my talking over top of this, hopefully if I'm doing it correctly, I'm projecting it to be about a 30 minute video. All right, now notice I put the stop loss above this fair value gap. Now watch this. The opening of this candle right here I'm watching how it performs at that. I want to see it dig into that and through it. Look what it's doing here. No, 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 no. We don't want to see that. That's respecting the opening price there. So I just closed and reopened a new trade. So when price was trading down here and I was watching it, this touch of that opening price inside this wick of the down close candle and it going right back above what? this candle's consequent encroachment and it's above the buy side of balance sell side efficiency this should have never happened here and went back above the opening price on that candle it should have never happened if it was bearish it should have never happened so while i'm watching price my focus and my attention was on this down close candle and do we smash through it and eat entirely through this and go outside of the low of this inefficiency. Now imagine what I just explained right there. You can't see that the same way in a book. You can't see it in a book. So when I'm providing these lessons like this, these are going to be like supplemental things that you can watch that I'll refer to in my books because you need to be able to see it dynamically, what it looks like as it's happening. Because a static picture doesn't accomplish anything except for, oh, well, yeah, that's interesting. But when you watch it, when you watch it unfold, then I'm going to take it back and let you see it again. The next candle, watch what happens. I'm already short now. Now watch it again. It's trading down. This candle right here, look at this price right there, where the end of my cursor is. Right there. That that should not go back up like that. As soon as I see this, I'm thinking to myself, okay, I'm offside. Now, you might be thinking, well, when you watched it the first time, you're thinking, okay, he, you know, maybe he wants to get a better entry up here. I would never do that. I would never close the trade if I want to add more to it here or if I still want to be short. I'm anticipating this level here to give way to the upside. So I'm about to go up and hit the buy button and go long five contracts. So I did not get stopped out. I stopped the short in a loss and went immediately long. So now I'm long. I'm placing the stop loss below the bodies of these candles here and at consequent encroachment of that wick. It, I don't fear that being retreated to because I had the defense of this candle's wick and the top of the imbalance that's over here in the blue shaded area. So now what I'm doing is I'm aiming for this area up here. Now because my son is trying to learn how to do this and he doesn't want to use stop losses. He's afraid if he puts stop loss in, he'll get he'll get stopped out. So what I sat down with him on Friday, explained to him, I said, "Listen, I'm gonna I'm gonna put 
a really, really tight stop loss on, one that it's not even realistic or, or practical in the hopes that I get stopped out and then I have to go back in and use what's still available in price action. As long as the objective up here isn't met, I have to use something in here as it forms or wait for it to form to go back in and reload another long position. So I'm expecting this to become an inversion fair value gap. Okay, and I'm watching price action here. Right away, this is where the stop should be throughout the entirety of the trade until we get through consequent encroachment of this wick. Because it's Friday, it's choppy, it's range bound. I just added more contracts. Now I'm trailing the stop loss up because he's asking me, you know, if I wanted to tra uh, trail the stop loss, where would I be able to do that and still be within a reasonable range without being stopped out inside of this blue shaded area? It's not going to come back down in there. Why? Why would I feel confident about that place and that stop right there? That's the highest it should be raised to until new structure is placed in this time frame for the one minute chart. This inefficiency here that's shaded blue, also this one here that's not highlighted. So in my mind, I'm thinking this candle has come down to here. We repriced to this level here. And because we have one clean candle to the downside, one clean candle on the upside, one directional, inside of this buy side of balance sell side of efficiency, this is a balanced price range. It need not come back below this low. But I'm further confident because I have the down close candle here that acted as what? The bull short block, which was problematic for my short. I wanted to watch this get taken out to the downside on my initial short entry. But because it reacted off the opening price here, I'm not interested in holding it. But I believe that it's going to run now TGIF, which is the weekly range high and low up to that point, which is the low that's over here somewhere. I believe it's going to go up 20 to 30% of the weekly range because it's Friday and we've had a nice bearish week. So it's going to want to go back against all of those individuals that are holding shorts. This is a realistic, easy objective, low hanging fruit objective. That's the buy side liquidity on the day on Friday. So it's reasonable to anticipate going up there. I mean, stop loss up into the opening price of this down close candle. It need not trade back there. Why? Because we already had one, two, three times to it all immediately after trading above it. So there's no need for it to come back down here. If it did come back down here, it's going to go lower. And I don't want to be in that position any longer. So I've reduced the risk a little bit by raising the stop loss up. And I want to see how price can get through this high here and this inefficiency. So I'm watching NASDAQ as I'm watching the delivery on the E-mini S&P. Now, this high here, I'm watching how NASDAQ wants to draw up into that. And much like over here, NASDAQ should not go below this low because we already repriced to this inefficiency there. And we've had low, lower low, lower low. So we have a bullish breaker here. Big up close candle right there. That's to the low right there. So we've wicked into this up close candle on the NASDAQ right there on the candle right there. The bodies have respected that bullish breaker. So this low should never be taken out. This should be uh, driven to for liquidity purposes. And whatever 20 to 30% of the weekly range is for NASDAQ and ES, that's where we're drawing to. That's my, that's my mindset. But I'm teaching my son low-hanging fruit objectives, bread and butter, income trading. This is where we're going to draw to, just for this idea. So back to the video. So I'm drawing my attention and my son's attention on the inversion fair value gap here. So we've already hit it here. Now my stop loss is trailed right below that. This is where I should not have raised it. 
and I'm showing him that just because they created another inversion fair value gap, don't run your stop loss up underneath that. Keep it in here because what defense do you have up here? You just have this inefficiency. And we did take this high out, which is fine, but we're already wicking through. So that's already indicative that we're likely to come back down and trade into this area again and do what? Upset anything in here that may be trailed up from this low up into here. Longs are going to be attacked. Price is gravitating to that shaded area up in here. I'm watching NASDAQ as it delivers higher. Notice that the low in here on this pullback is inside of an inefficiency and it reached up higher. Now, there is the mistake again. That's what he wants to do. He wants to, he wants to raise the stop loss up just below this fair value gap. Never, 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 never do that. Okay? Never do that. Patrick, if you're listening, I don't know you are. We have a shift in market structure here. Never put your stop loss in or at a fair value gap after a shift in market structure. Never do that because it's going to gravitate to it. Rebalancing and repricing. That's what I'm basically telling my son at the time. But the expectation is we're going to look for it to trade there. If it does run and never come back to the stop loss, then that would be just luck. But I'm placing it there because I want him to see that this is a flawed logic. Never put your stop loss that's being trailed in a fair value gap immediately after a shift in market structure. Okay, so buy side was taken on the NASDAQ over here. This would be the last line of defense, this down close candle right here. If it goes through this, then it's going to run into this fair value gap there and take the stop. And I also was telling him we're not going to do any partials on these trades. I want you to see what it's like to be in a full pull. A full pull is from entry to target, no partials taken. So normally this right here would be a good idea to see it run right up in here and take out the buy side. And that's what I'm saying. I'm saying no, you would expect that price delivery here. And it could very well do that. But you never, never, never want to put your stop loss inside of a fair value gap immediately after a shift in market structure. Always give allowance for the market wanting to likely go back in and reprice to these inefficiencies like this. Looking at the NASDAQ, we've taken this high out. So where's the imbalance at? From this high taking this high out here, where's the inefficiency? Right there. You don't want to put a stop loss in there if you're long. Watch the wick. Consequent encouragement here. So I'm just going to scroll through and look at the other averages. And there is a buy side liquidity pool there. And it's a drawn liquidity for the Dow, which is on the right-hand side. Now I'm going to pull up the dollar index. Pulling up Euro. So Euro is moving higher. So that means we have a risk-on scenario. So I feel that we're, we're on side now. But that stop loss is going to be problematic. So... I'm inviting the opportunity for the market to take that stop and then show my son how we would get right back in when there's an opportunity to do so. So going long down here, going short, reversing offside, now on side long, adding adding, 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 breaker, fair value gap, that's really an inversion fair value gap, and then put the stop loss in an area where we have nice handsome profits up here, but it's all going to go away and stop out in profit, but still nonetheless give up all that 
and then we'd have to go back in and rebuild it all again. Okay, so I'm showing him that right there is not an inversion fair value gap because it's a shift in market structure here. Go back through that leg. Where's the inefficiency? It's right here. So it's below, it goes below this. So you can't look at that as, oh, it's going to be a, a reason to go long. No. That's me just telling you as the audience members after I get, can get done teaching my son. But right now I'm telling him that the consequent encroachment of that wick right there may be enough to stop it from rallying. And now he did a raising of a stop once more. So what did I do there? I chased it too soon. It did not pierce and trade through the other side north of the consequent encroachment of this wick. It didn't do that. So now I'm inviting the market to stop me out, albeit profitably. But if we're looking for this objective up here and the market has not essentially disrupt the underlying market structure to be a long holder, then we can go in and reposition going long. Yes, there's a lot of things the way out. And that's what makes this stuff difficult. It's not because my stuff is complicated. It's because trading in general is not a one trick pony approach. It's this, there's things you have to the way out. And the worst thing you do is run a trailed stop loss too quickly. If you watch my executions, the ones that I'm doing the best in are the ones where I keep my stop loss far away. So I'm not managing, you know, mental capital. Okay, getting stopped out. Now returning back into the inversion fair value gap. Now I'm going long at consequent encroachment of this inversion fair value gap with the expectation and allowance for it may trade down to the low of this area and go one one tick or so below it. Why would I be willing to accept that? Because that's coloring outside the lines. That's normal. So I'm placing a stop loss here. This is effective stop loss placement because it's below the consequent encroachment of this candles wick below the consequent encroachment of this candles wick which is also the low of this inversion fair value gap so i'm in my mind i'm thinking okay it could it could trade down to that low of that shaded area and still i'm i'm protected with that stop loss because i have this fair value gap which is an inversion fair value gap see how it went below a little bit that's fine i'm not worried about that it can go through one tick or so below the consequent encroachment of this wick. That's completely acceptable. You may have freaked out seeing that. I've seen this so many times. I'm not worried about that either. That's not a concern for me. So notice I'm, I'm looking over here, showing my son other things because I already know this is already sorted. Look at the bodies. How do I feel confident? Because we stopped inside the fair value gap, which is an inversion fair value gap right there. And it opened right at the bottom of that shaded area. So I know I'm on side now. There's nothing for me to be concerned about. Absolutely not at all. Not one thing is worrying me. And look what happened. The NASDAQ trades down into that fair value gap. That's inside a displacement leg after a buy side run. Think about it. This is exactly where you want to accumulate a long position. Think. <laughs> so why would you want to put a stop loss there? Same way over here. So now I'm going to sit back and watch this thing roll up. See the delivery on the S&P? Very quickly running up into this inefficiency here. Now, I don't want to see this act as resistance. I want to see it perform a function much like you would expect classic support, which would be resistance broken, turn support. I want to see something to that effect. We have a volume imbalance in here that price could draw up into, which it just does now here. This dotted line here, or dash line, if you watch that, uh, see what this did? Trade down into the fair value gap there. So we want to see it reaccumulate in that area and send price up into here. 
But this dotted line or dashed line, I talked about what that is in the live stream on Friday. So just go back and watch that. I took it off my YouTube channel, but there's a fellow on Twitter that uploaded it. Uh, that's, that's me adding more because I'm buying five more on this volume imbalance right there, which I'm highlighting for you now. This is a nice long here on NASDAQ. So if I hadn't had any trades on at all, I would be wanting to go long here on NASDAQ. And if I wasn't trading the S&P, and you're probably saying, okay, ICT, why did you trade the S&P and not the NASDAQ? That's the question I need you to answer. Like, I need you to answer that. <laughs> it's because the S&P failed to make a lower low like the NASDAQ did. So this was a relatively stronger one. Look at the volume of balance. Look at that. Isn't that it's beautiful, isn't it? When you're on one side and you understand the narrative, it's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Look at the bodies respecting the high end of that fair value gap, but we're accumulating new longs in here to a discount PD array just outside of it, which is this volume and balance there. It's also bullish order block. Look at the run on NASDAQ. Handsomely now. Watching the consequent encroachment of this wick, half wick. In other words, it's got to go above this candle right there. Now you can roll the stop up. I'm contemplating doing a market there, but I said, no, nah, let me just do a limit order on 18. That'll keep too long, and then I'll roll the stop up like I did there. Notice what I did. I waited for it to get above the threshold here that sets the stage for all of this. So you watch my limit order get hit there. NASDAQ to rolling through. And now, because I don't care and I have other things I want to do, I put the stop loss here. If it runs down and hits the stop loss, I'm done. I don't care. If it were to keep going, wonderful. I'll check it at 3 o'clock. But as you'll see, the market does, in fact, come back down and hits that. So it's a lot of management of expectations, looking at specific PD arrays, and looking at where price should rebalance. Okay, so we got stopped out there, and I'm showing you the executions. I'll magnify it. And that is the business. So you can see the short, this opening price on this down close candle. When it was trading down here, I didn't want to see any respect of that. It started showing respect of it. I was like, okay, I'm offside, reverse. Attention goes to here. And I facetiously actually, <laughs> I know it gets on some of your nerves. Oh, you're so arrogant, ICT. I just, I just blocked a guy sending a, a message on my YouTube comments saying that uh, I have such a condescending tone and I should just teach for the purpose of teaching. I am. But I'm also responding to a lot of argumentative people that have no idea what they're talking about. They'll say that I don't know how to trade, that I don't trade with real money, and you see it on Twitter. Okay, I'm doing it there. So sometimes when I'm talking and I'm being what many of you think is arrogance, it's just me confidently responding and neutering the young pups out there that think they know what they're talking about or they think they know what I'm doing. You don't. And if you can do better, make your YouTube videos show you doing it. I'll watch it. And if you're good, other people will recognize it. But I don't give a stage for people to do that in my comment section. And if you're here to learn, just, just learn. Filter it. If something doesn't jive with you, okay, if it makes you uncomfortable because I talk a specific way or talk about things that may feel like it's outside the scope of the learning, you have to understand you're not my only student. So there's a lot of people out there that are taking the things that other people say about me because they are too new as a student with me. And they think, oh, this person may know more about this guy, ICT, than I do. Let me just take their opinion and apply it to myself without doing any due diligence and finding out if there's any validity to what it is that ICT teaches. So the logic here is undeniable. And I could have done a full pull, one entry, no pyramiding, 
and then let it go to the subjective. And that's what I'm actually doing at the time right here. I'm telling my son now, think about what we did down here. That's your entry. You could put your full position on with a really, really small stop loss here and be comfortable with that risk. But as it's going up, I'm teaching him how to look at every time there's an instance to add a new contract or contracts, building the position up. And then over here, going along again inside the inversion fair value gap, look at the bodies all on this over here. I'm sorry, but we're not supply and demand, folks. Okay. And this is not a freaking flip zone. <laughs> okay. You guys are trying so hard to find some other way to, to explain what it is I'm doing. Sorry, you're not going to have it. Okay. Uh, before Sam Sidon was ever a thing and supply and demand was a thing, I was already out here doing this, teaching other people. So I apologize if that offends you. I'm sorry if it sounds condescending or arrogant, but that's simply the facts, Jack. So anyway, um, this is something that you can learn how to do. And when I have all these rectangles on here, it's to show you how, like a mountain climber. Okay, you ever watch a mountain climber? There's lots of videos on YouTube. Look at it. Look them up. There isn't one any one particular video that comes to mind off the top of my head, but when you watch a free climber, that means he has no ropes. Just chalk bag and their grip. And that's it. And balls of steel. Almost suicidal, in my opinion. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know why anybody would want to do this stuff, but hey, it is what it is, right? But when I look at the market wanting to go higher, okay, when I'm looking at how price may want to ascend, think about this low down here as the the ground level, and this is the the highest point of a a cliff or a mountainside or a face of a wall that needs to be climbed. Well, you're a mountain climber and you work your way up here and then you have to take a different route. Sometimes you got to go down before you can go up. So that's what's happening here. The market's going down, picking up more opportunity to put a foothold on the surface of this mountain rock. This high down to that low. Looking where the other footholds exist and you have to map that out see i'm not looking at price right here every, every little individual candle and if you're a live streamer and you're you're zoomed in and you only have like six candles on the screen and you're so so zoomed in you're missing so much detail inside of the fractal itself that lends so well to understanding what you should be doing why you shouldn't be freaking out or afraid that you're going to get stopped out or running your stop loss up too quickly that's what my son wants to do. He wants to have a very few number of candlesticks because the more candlesticks makes him question, well, why not this one and why not that one? Well, it's because you don't know anything yet. And you have to give yourself time to see how the market will refer to these old price levels. Look at the inefficiency here. There isn't one in here. And once you get above this high, look to the left. Where's the inefficiencies at? It's just this one. So you have to take that, extend it through price. Why? Because the market created the inefficiency here. It acted as a resistance. So it respected it. Then eventually it was repriced it. Where did the body close on this candle? At the high of it, right there. So that's a signature. That's an algorithmic signature that I've codified. Me, the guy that you're listening to, I did that. Okay. I don't know how else to make it any plainer than that. When the market comes back up to it here, and passes through and leaves it, now this becomes a balanced price range. We do not expect it to go through it and go creaming lower. We don't expect that at all. You see the signatures of it here. Please find that in retail. Find that in Wyckoff. Find that in supply and demand. Find that level of precision in anything else out there. It is not there, folks. It's not. But it's here now. I'm the embodiment of it. I'm the voice behind it. You're seeing it, you're understanding it, and you're inside of the learning environment of its author. The market clears this 
candle here. This is a bullish order block. Small little fair value gap there. If the narrative is bullish, that qualifies this as a valid bullish order block. <gasps> yeah. You have to have the narrative because a down closed candle otherwise is just a down closed candle. Volume and balance. Look how it respects that. Folks, that is perfect. That's perfect. Steve Nielsen will never teach you that. Okay? There's no other educator out there. Dan, not happening. Hearst, ain't happening. Nothing. John Murphy got nothing like that in his book about this. No market wizard in any Jack Swagger's books know anything about this. And that's just the God's honest truth. I'm sorry if that upsets you and it gets your team mentality all in a disarray. <laughs> but it's the truth. And if you want to fight it and resist it, you do it at your own peril. You're deferring new understanding with truth. And you can't wrestle with truth and become victorious. You can only deny the inevitable for the near term because eventually it grinds you down and you can't escape it. I've had so many people come as a troll and eventually just listen to me. Go in and see if it isn't really there. If it's not there, you'll see that it's not there. But if it is there, whew, that's a big jagged pill you got to swallow, isn't it? And for the people that have character, they have done that. And I haven't slapped around and said, see, you idiot. No. I just encourage them, well done. You didn't just take something at face value that other people say and not did the, the due diligence that's required to see that this is in fact the truth of what makes these markets go up and down. They're scripted, folks. They're absolutely scripted. And when you understand the source code, hint, hint, nudge, nudge, You can read them just like a book that you've read so many times. You know the character. You know the plot. You know the outcome. You know everything they're going to say verbatim. And to the onlookers, to a lay audience, it looks like wizardry. It looks like fraud. It looks like you're using a rented MT4 server. Well, we're not using MT4 at all right now. And that power. That insight, that visibility is the closest thing I can put you in terms of time travel. So I hope we found something insightful in this. If not anything else, encouraging. And so I'll talk to you next time. Be safe.